Thank you, thank you, mate. You should wait until after I've given my presentation and then see if you want to. I want you to step back and think of the people who have had cancer among your friends and family in the last five, ten years. The first treatment is usually some combination of surgery, radiation, and chemo, right? Well, that hasn't changed in decades. But you read about all these amazing new cancer drugs. Now cancer immunotherapy, using your own immune system to fight cancer, is considered to be the future. By the way, when we started it, people said we were dumb, it would never work. But it's now the future, and you've got drugs like Keytruda and Optivo that ring up 10 billion dollars in sales with profit margins probably in excess of 95 percent. If you have a cancer drug, it's an enormous profit margin. It's better than 10 gold mines combined. Combined, if People always find money for cancer. Insurance companies cannot challenge the price of a cancer drug, which is why these cancer drugs are now selling between two and five hundred thousand dollars. It's ridiculous. But all the current cancer drugs are being developed for patients who where the term is no longer intent to cure. You've already failed surgery, radiation, chemo, it comes back. There's no more intentional for cure. We want to give you more time. And that's what these drugs do. We, on the other hand, believe that the key to trying to cure more people up front is the immune system. Because we're all alive, right? We've all fought off all kinds of diseases. Our immune system obviously works. It's the best way of dealing with disease. What cancer does is it comes in, it blinds your immune system. It's like a terrorist. It, it will hide from the immune system. So we, I will show you a slide of, of cancer killing cells that sit inside the cancer, not knowing they're sitting inside the cancer. What I'll tell you is our drug helps the immune system see the cancer. It's like the intel that you give to the police and now they can hunt down the terrorists. So we are the only one in the world who can put their medicine ahead of surgery, radiation, and chemo. The reason we're the only one, I know it's a strong statement, is because you cannot delay the first intent to cure surgery. It's clearly known in the scientific world that if I delay your surgery, the tumor may spread to the lymph nodes or your lung or your brain, and that will kill you, and ethically, no regulator or hospital review board will give you permission for such a study. You also cannot forego that. The current standard of care, we focus on head and neck cancer, I'll explain it to you, it's a huge cancer all by itself. The last approval by FDA was 60 years ago in, in our indication, but we focus on it. Um, it, it. There's one standard of care. We give these patients everything, surgery, radiation, and chemo, and then it's about a 50-50 shot of being alive at three years. And I'll explain to you why and how we intend to make that one better. Our goal is to take the 50% survival to 60 or 70% by adding the powers that are in our own immune system. We do so by helping our own immune system realize that there's a tumor. And that, in combination with the current treatments, should give you a more successful first treatment. So here, what you see here is all the other drugs are after surgery, radiation, chemo, we're the only one before. You cannot take a k Truda and move it up front because it requires a minimum of three months. You can't fit that into three weeks. And by the way, it only works in 25% of people and it's also toxic. You can't add more toxicity because the toxicity from combined radiation chemo is so bad it already kills people. If you add any more toxicity, you're going to kill more people. So if we're right, this is going to be first in head and neck cancer, but then it will move to breast cancer, melanoma, cervical cancer. So there is nothing small about this idea. This will be a new way of treating cancer with the goal of giving you a greater chance of living right up front. So this is in more detail. You guys all have a slide presentation on your desk. So I will skip over, over some of these things. We are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We're very actively traded stock. We trade on the order of, I don't know, eight, nine, ten million dollars a day. Um, that's because we're becoming more rel relevant. It's very, very simple. We've had a we've, we've almost completed an eight-year phase three clinical trial. During these eight years, because we're blinded, we were not allowed to give clinical data. So for eight years, what do you do? I mean, people essentially moved on. We've become invisible. But now that we're at the end, people were becoming visible again. That's why 
why people in the stock is trading more, that's why the stock is reacting, that's why a stock is volatile, and uh, I call it increased relevance. And by the way, every single cancer drug that improves the overall survival, and by the way, most cancer drugs don't improve your chance of living, but everyone that does in the last few years that's gotten bought out by pharma companies, you will see it, they got bought out even before FDA approval for five to 12 billion dollars. Why? because there are so few cancer drugs that actually provide real benefit. Um, we have an experienced management team. I've actually, uh, probably, not many people can say this, my management team's been with me for 25 years. Um, and so you can look at this um, on your own. We, other than the head and neck cancer, Drug. It's actually an immunotherapy drug. We also we have some very nice data in cervical cancer, where the same medicine also kills the human papilloma virus, which, by the way, is the cause of many cancers. So we have a big time booster at the NIH, U.S. Institute of Health, who believes that this drug will become the drug of choice for virally induced cancers. And by now we know that a lot of cancers are actually caused by a virus because an immune system drug has the capacity to kill both the virus that kills, that causes the cancer and the actual cancer because that is what your immune system is designed to do. We also have another technology that's uh, being paid for uh, completely by the US government, a million and a half dollar grant for a rheumatoid arthritis vaccine, which is very interesting to reprogram your immune system so it no longer attacks itself. But the focus, Wall Street can only focus on one thing, so we're, fo we're focused on the phase three clinical trial. So like I said, Cancer immunotherapy was completely out of favor five, six years ago. People figured out that uh, the immune system actually cannot see the tumor, so then they said, okay, if we fix that, then the immune system can be used to fight cancer. And now people are becoming very cognizant that probably the best time to use your immune system to fight cancer is while it's actually still healthy. Because once you've had surgery, radiation, and chemo, your immune system is destroyed. It's that simple. But we're the only ones, like I told you, because we only fit, we're the only ones who fit into the three-week time window. Um, so we, in order to prove this, when you have something this big, you've got to make it the elephant in the room. This is a big room, but if I walk an elephant in here, I think you'll all notice. And this is the elephant in the room study, 928 patients in head and neck cancer. It's the largest study ever done in 24 countries, um, including US and Canada, obviously. 100 centers, fully controlled. MD Anderson controls the radiation therapy. We buy those cisplatin chemotherapy from one manufacturer distributed among all 100 sites. Fully blinded, controlled to the highest and highest standard, which is important because that was the standard of 10 years ago, but FDA today is much, much more lenient because FDA wants to put more drugs on the market, so you don't even have to meet these super high standards anymore. Um, there's only one standard of care, so if we win, we win everything. The current standard of care, surgery, radiation, chemo, if we win the new standard of care for these patients, it's hundreds of thousands of patients, is our drug, surgery, radiation, chemo. The goal is not initially to eliminate your surgery. Right now the tongue still needs to be cut out. It's barbaric, I agree, but it's in a stepwise fashion. You get it on the market and then people will play around with it and maybe they can keep their tongue and all of those things. Right now the goal is to increase your chance of living, right? Because you, in the end, and we really just don't want to die. Um, all right, so our drug is a mixture of cytokines. Cytokines are the substances that we're all currently making. We are copying the average of all of us here. It sounds simple, it took us 10 years, $100 million. We had to build a specialized manufacturing facility in Maryland, which has been checked out by the European regulators on a regular basis and we passed. FDA and the Canadians do not come during the phase three clinical trial, they only come at the end. And essentially what's been shown is that if you don't make these cytokines, you cannot reject a tumor, that means you die. So we're giving these cytokines to help the patient reject a tumor and that seems to be what's happening. We did multiple clinical trials over the years, but we will only present to you the last one because it's identical in the dosage and treatment to the phase three study. 
So we're hoping that the phase two result is a good indicator of the results we'll see in the phase three study, and it looks more and more like it actually is. But we are blinded, I'll explain that to you. We don't have all of the detailed information. Um, I'll show you who does, and therefore their actions matter. But you can still, on a statistical mathematical basis, figure out that something good is going on here because patients are not dying like they ought to be dying. And it's unlikely that we, our little company at 100 centers in 24 countries, are suddenly curing cancer patients with the old treatments and a rate in a manner any better than it used to be in, the, in history, right? That's very unlikely. So it really should be our drug. So <clears throat> um, why we focused on head and neck cancer? Most people don't think about it, but it's from under your nose down to your clavicle, it's 6% of all cancers. And the reason we focused on it is because, number one, pharmaceutical companies have no interest in it. They really don't have any effective treatments for it, so therefore we're not stepping on the toes of the powers to be. Because I have to tell you, cancer is a big business. Um, number two, it's an unmet medical need. Every other person is dead in about three years. The last approval by FDA was 50, 60 years ago, methotrexate, and we have orphan drug designation in the United States, which means there are less than 200,000 cases in the United States. Most of the most successful new drugs in the United States have orphan drug designation. And while science is a sound small, they are multi-billion dollar drugs without competition. And the prices, by the way, are astronomical for any one of us. It's just we don't see it because insurance companies have to pay it. <clears throat> so, um, and we fit into the treatment. It takes about four weeks to set you up for surgery, which is why we can treat for three weeks. If we wanted to treat for four weeks, we wouldn't be allowed to because, remember, you're not allowed to delay that first surgery. It might harm the patient. So the market for head and neck cancer, if that's the only thing we ever do, it's massive, 650,000. Let's be completely chauvinistic and disregard any place but North America, and I'm sorry, Canada is not even included here. I really apologize for that one. And uh, about, I think it's about 12,000 cases in Canada. Um, Europe, so 165,000 cases, two thirds of them are advanced primary patient population. If it's standard of care, you usually expect 75% market penetration because number one is the recommended treatment. Insurance companies can't reject it. And also, if the patient dies, you might find yourself being sued as a doctor. And what, you don't have a very good defense if you didn't follow standard of care. So the numbers get obscene. If you just pick half of two thirds here, to call it 55,000 people, let's assume 150,000, which is below the no, uh, the, let's just make it 200,000. The market for this alone is $11 billion. This is bigger than other cancer drugs because it is right up front. No one's been cured yet. No one's uh, been killed. Uh, no, no one's died yet. And it basically takes the place of surgery, right? There's still surgery, but we go. So we are essentially becoming the new surgery. What's the market for surgery? And then I'll explain it to you, but you'll see. The problems that afflict head and neck cancer patients are identical, breast cancer, melanoma, all over. You don't die from that which you see, you die from the cells you cannot see. I'll explain it to you. So that's, this slide explains it. You don't die from the tumor. If you can see it, you can cut it out. Then why do you die? You die from the micrometastases around a tumor and in the adjacent lymph nodes. The moment you have lymph node involvement, you're pretty screwed. So the surgeons know that, they cut wide, it's called wide margin surgery. But they invariably miss some of those cells because they can't see them. So the statement that the surgeon says, I think I got it all, it's a wonderful statement, but it's not based on any fact because you, can't, you don't even know where they are in the first place. But it's a nice thing to say. So just to be on the safe side, they give you radiation and chemo. And yes, they have improved survival. And by the way, radiation and chemo at the same time is so bad it will even kill people. But we now have about 55% three-year survival. The reason why you die is most tumors recur locally where your original tumor is, let's say tongue or your lymph nodes. 90% of them recur there. That means you didn't get all the cells in the first place. The cells survived the surgery, they survived radiation and chemo, and now there's nothing holding back that tumor anymore, and patients die, about 90% of them will die within a year. 
and Kate Ruder now has shown some benefit. It extends life by a few months. That's good. That's wonderful. But it doesn't, en doesn't end what will happen to you. It doesn't, it doesn't change it. So we inject at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock around the tumor, five days a week for three weeks. Remember, we only have three weeks. And the goal is not to eliminate the tumor. It's only three weeks. The goal is to eliminate, through the immune system, the red cells. No one can see them. No technology can find them. But the healthy immune system, that's what it's made for. It's designed to find and kill these cancer cells. Our goal, therefore, is to clean the margins, take away the red micrometastases, and also on the lymph nodes. We inject below the ear to drain into your lymph nodes. The immune system has been shown that there's a tumor. The immune system is still strong. The immune system does what it's designed to do. It eliminates all or a large part of these micrometastases. There's nothing left to regrow. Well, if the tumor doesn't come back, you're cured. Right? That is what we all want. So um, this is a mass-produced product, so it's not too expensive to manufacture. We have our own manufacturing facility. In patients in phase two, we showed that 10% of patients by pathology, that's an exact science under a microscope, had zero remaining cancer cells. There's no way our drug's responsible for that. It's your immune system. We help the immune system see the tumor. The immune system eliminated billions of cancer cells in three weeks. Other patients had 50% less cancer cells. Right? This is with no toxicity. Before you even started surgery, radiation, chemo, how could that not reflect itself in an improved survival? And by the way, quality of life is also improved. People can open their mouths, they can eat again. It's the opposite of head and neck cancer patients. That resulted in a 33% increase in overall survival. We met with the regulators. The greatest supporters in our history have been the Canadian regulators. And we agreed with the regulators, with FDA, they were the strictest. They wanted 10% overall survival because 10 years ago when we started this, they wanted absolute statistical proof. They no longer ask for that. But that's what we have to do. We have to wait for 298 people to die out of 800. So there are 928 patients, 800 on comparison groups, and 298 have to die. And then you have your 10%, you have your statistical proof. And... Uh, they should have died already, okay? That's the bottom line, they should have died. And that hasn't happened. So that's when people started waking up to the possibility that maybe this crazy little company actually has something that's gonna change the way we treat cancer. These are some of the partners. NIH is doing genetic molecular markers uh, and their whole bunch of partners. I'm told I have to run along. Toxicity. So we all assume a cancer drug has toxicity, right? Well, look at our toxicity. It should be called by FDA, who's the only one who can determine if it's toxic or not, it should be called the first non-toxic cancer drug. Which, by the way, is not surprising because these cytokines, the way we administer them, we are all making them right now and none of us look toxic. We can show the world we can do better. Right now we accept toxicities, we don't have to accept toxicities. When will it end? If you look at, we started enrolling in 2011. Three-year survival rate of 55%, which, by the way, we looked at the data, has not improved. So, and people don't stop dying at three years. It's, it's, it's this huge study. The 55% the survival is based upon decades of data, hundreds of thousands of patients. So there's got to be some survival benefit and thereby not having reached 298 deaths. But, like an, an intelligence gathering, you need to confirm your assumptions by something from a completely different source, right? Different data set. And that's what happened. So the only people who know everything are FDA and the other 23 regulators who get annual reports. We've had nine of them, unblinded, all data. They've never had a problem with it. And then the IDMC committee that oversees the study. You may have seen Biogen lost $30 billion in market cap in, in March because the IDMC, the committee that oversees it, said the study will not work, it's futile. Well, the flips, so they, they can make two choices, these, these people, they see everything, these doctors. They can see that your study can continue, or they can say it's not gonna work. In March, our IDMC said continue. We are at the end of the study. We all should already have had 298 deaths. Don't you think that they know if the study is gonna be successful? 
because what they have to find is a likelihood that you can make 10% improvement overall survival. If you're at the very end, you've got to have good survival benefit already for you to say to continue, because if you're not there, it's not going to be successful. That's when our stock started moving up. Remember, if this works, this could easily be a $10 billion company. When could it happen? It could happen in three months, in six months, in nine months. We don't know when the requisite number of people will die. But when all the indicators, and I have some other ones, point in the same direction, then essentially um, that's suggested. So very, very quickly here, this is the stock chart of the last few months. I do have to add a little something. In the last few days, we had a major short attack. Um, these people, what they want is they want me to do a deal with them to cover their short position, and I refuse to do a deal with them. So every so often they attack us, every so often I say, screw you, and I have enough money. I've gotten $11 million from warrants this year. They just don't like to be beaten. But, you know, they are so far a very big, even right now a stock is knocked down in the last two days, they are still losing millions of dollars. The bottom line is, we will live and die by our data, but if the study was going to fail, it would have failed a while ago, because we would have had 298 deaths by the fact that we don't have 298 deaths, and the IDMC said, continue, that means we have a survival benefit, and with the current FDA, they're looking for ways for bringing a drug to market, which then results in, even before FDA approval, buyout prices that have ranged between five and 12 billion dollars. We're at the end of a 32-year battle. We started when no one believed in the concept. Now people believe in the concept. We're at the end of all of this. It suggests we'll be successful, so hopefully we will also be one of those 12 billion dollar companies. Thank you so much. Is there time for questions or, or not? Well, quickly. Okay, two minutes, so, right, so we better hurry. Any, any questions? Yes, sir. It's not last resort. Remember, these people have just... Our idea is you treat them before they become last resorts. If we're successful, they never become last resort patients. They're stages three and four. So there's one, two, three, four. So they're, they're the bad stages, but if it's just been discovered, they haven't yet received any treatment. So when you go to the dentist, they ought to be looking around your mouth. They're looking for our kind of cancer, which is so gruesome, they cut half your face off. Ugh. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, then you have, at a certain point, you have a, a, a widening of the survival curves where it, it raises severe ethical issues. We don't have the data exactly, but historically, in the case of, this is sometimes seen in the case of terminal cancer patients where everybody is expected to die, and let's say only 80% are dead at the expected time period, then they can quickly bring it to market. It's, what we're doing has never been done, but the, the idea should be the same thing. If something looks so good that you say you really shouldn't withhold it from the market, then FDA historically has brought it to the market early. Now, this is very important. FDA in the last few years has approved more drugs and more often drugs than they have in the last 30 years combined. They want to bring drugs out there. Part of that, by the way, is the Trump mission, whether you like Trump or not. He wants to bring drug prices down and he wants to create competition, except in cancer it won't work because so few cancer drugs actually increase life. But it's, it, overall, it's a good idea. You have a question? Not all types of cancer, but essentially it's an immune system drug. So one of the components, TNF-alpha, kills the cancer cell, whichever it is, breast, it's cervical, melanoma, and then the immune response is against that antigen. And that's, it's completely specific to your tumor once it's injected in your tumor, to my tumor once it's injected on my tumor, and that's the only way. See, cancer drug development is like whack them all. Oh, we have this great new target, so we hit it here. Well, two years later, it pops up over there. Isn't that the history? Haven't you heard about this great new treatment for cancer? And then a few years later, it really doesn't work well anymore. They have to come up with a great new treatment. That's whack them all. 
the immune system is the only way to cover all the bases because the immune system evolves with the tumor's defense mechanisms. The tumor cannot mutate away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?